Uh, just a, a quick show of hands. Did anybody catch the breakout session this morning on maneuvering data in the Pacific? Okay, so there's a couple there. Okay, uh, good news is I'm not saying anything in this presentation that is orthogonal or, or differentiated from, from the perspective that was shared. And that was, that's good, because I, I was a little concerned by the topic that we were going to focus on speeds and feeds. And, and I don't think speeds and feeds give you the decision dominance that, that we're after. Um, and I, I think distributed edge computing becomes a, a necessary element, a, a part of the recipe for success. So I'm going to hopefully not make the mic go like that. So the agenda, uh, basically I'm going to focus a quarter of my time defining terms. I think it's really important to be on the same sheet of music. Uh, I think at a, a lot of these conferences, um, initially and throughout, you end up playing uh, technology and operations buzzword bingo. Uh, and I want to be able to create some reality uh, and, and challenge or at least position what I mean when I'm saying distributed edge computing and what I think decision dominance uh, entails. We're then going to cover uh, shortening the kill chain. I put in the abstract, uh, I'm still old school. I still think the OODA loop means something. I think compressing, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act does shorten the kill chain. But just to be contemporary buzzword compliant, I put the kill chain words on, on the agenda. Uh, we're going to explore the, the CIA triad uh, from a data perspective, from a workload perspective, and notionally from an AI ML perspective. Uh, quickly assess some viability in congested, contested environments, things that we can do. Uh, I'm going to propose some technology accelerators, uh, give a, a shameless plug for where the booth is for Red Hat downstairs, um, and then open up for Q&A. So why care about this in the first place? Why care about distributed edge comp computing? Uh, I, would, I would posit that the DOD itself is a microcosm of everything you see in commercial industries right now. And there's commercial verticals adopting distributed edge computing across the world, globally. Uh, we've got the quote here on the right-hand side, by 2025, three quarters of enterprise generated data will be created and processed at the edge outside of a traditional data center or cloud. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be pushing stuff to data centers and clouds. Ideally, though, it's not going to be raw data. Or when it is raw data, it's going to be burst. I want to be smarter than my equipment. We're good? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, Telco, from a, a verticals, uh, a commercial perspective, sees uh, equivalents across DOD in metropolitan networks, in tactical 5G, uh, financial and healthcare, personnel, uh, the, the N1, J1, uh, information sharing, uh, industrial, could be shipyards, could be depots, uh, smart cities could be uh, a float, could be a carrier, could be a fleet group. Autonomous vehicles could be autonomous or semi-autonomous systems on deck plate, could be autonomous vehicles themselves. So there's a natural marriage between what we're seeing in commercial globally and what DOD is faced with as challenges in this theater and, and globally itself. So I'm going to start by describing and defining individually the distributed part, the, the edge part, and the computing part. Uh, I want to start with defining what distributed is not. It, it's not pushing everything back to a big brain so it can push everything back down to you so it can tell you what to do. Uh, the great military strategist Mike Tyson uh, pointed out that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. We do not want to give our peer adversary a face to punch. And if you do a big brain approach of passing everything up channel and then everything back down and the decisions are made for you out elsewhere, in other words, if you don't embrace the concept of distributed edge computing, distributed computing, distributed C2, as they pointed out in the morning session, 
then you're you're losing out on uh, where you're giving your your peer adversary a really big attack vector, and you're losing out on the ability to make decisions inside of their OODA loop. There's also challenges for backhauling everything. So let's say you did have ubiquitous comms. Let's say CJADC2, whether it's uh, through the vision of convergence for the Army, overmatch for the Navy, or ABMS for the Air Force, gives you the biggest pipes and you can pass all the data all the places. You still have DDL conditions. You still have uh, congested and contested environments. You have uh, asset density, data gravity, uh, and cognitive overload. You, if, if you pass everything around and you try and make everybody smart on everything, then everybody becomes effectively dumb on everything. So what, what does distributed look like? Distributed moves assessment and utilization forward to increase speed of decisions and speed of actions. And this is actually n not just something that's been mentioned at, at, at the conference and uh, echoed in the earlier sessions. This is directly out of Joint Pub 332 for Joint Maritime Operations. So you've got a philosophy of mission command involving centralized guidance and collaborative planning. So my op plan, my, my, my op board, my frago, my, my directions are coming top down. Uh, that guidance could be uh, predictive maintenance schedules. That guidance could be uh, model training. Uh, the, the guidance doesn't have to be always about kinetic effects. It doesn't have to always be about C2, but it's decentralized control and execution, and that's critical. Uh, a distributed environment is a decentralized environment from a decision-making perspective. Decentralizing it, so shift left even further out to military IoT devices, and you're further accelerating speed of decisions and actions. This is uh, what we see in the 2022 uh, National Defense Strategy with de uh, deterrence by resilience. So a more resilient and agile environment means that you're pushing more and more capabilities, you're generating and creating actionable intelligence at the far edge so that you don't have a cognitive overload burden as you move across the, the battle spectrum. Uh, but equally, it means that you can make better use of the compute you have at the distributed edges to be able to make those decisions quicker. Okay, from distributed being a decentralized decision-making piece, I want to now look at defining the edge itself. And again, what the edge is not. The edge isn't a place. The edge isn't a size. It's not a form factor. Uh, Across DOG, edge is a spectrum. It, it's a, uh, I, I break it out here into sort of fixed edge and tactical edge and mobile tactical edge, all the way down to putting single board compute on, on an individual sensor and having it do a particular job. Uh, what I also want to distinguish is there's heterogeneity in what you do at your edges across DOD. Um, I mark things as recomposable architectures and disposable architectures. Recomposable, I'm a multifunction thing. I've got more than one job to do. I need to be configured so that I can uh, execute more than one mission. And I want to be able to change what that mission is based on where I'm located or based on new constraints coming in. That's a, a, a recomposable architecture. A disposable architecture is a single purpose one. I'm going to replace you. I'm not going to repair you. I'm not going to worry about an update and patch schedule to you. I'm going to make a new you because you have a single purpose job to do. Both of those fit. So both recomposable architectures and disposable architectures fit within that DOD edge spectrum. And there's different technology choices to be selected for meeting those needs in each of those scenarios. So. That's what edge isn't. It's not a particular place. It's not a particular um, form factor. Defining edge from an industry perspective, Gartner says, says edge computing is part of a distributed computing topology where information processing is located close to the edge. I, I hate it when somebody uses a word in the definition that is the word itself, but we'll go with it. Uh, where things and people produce or consume that information. Uh, 
Gartner points out a distributed aspect to Edge even without having distributed in front of it, which I thought was interesting. Forrester creates a workload affinity concept, so it gives you four buckets that you can put the Edge spectrum into. You've got enterprise, provider, operational, and engagement. So from a DOD mission focus perspective, uh, the, the mission edge is a dynamic, decentralized computing architecture that's comprised of heterogeneous hardware and workloads that enable near proximity between data producers and consumers. So the DOD edge is a superset of that Forrester grouping. Each of those elements is re represented there. And there are common characteristics that we can take away in defining edge. It's decentralized decision making. Um, it is resilient operations. Again, that tracks right with the 2022 uh, NDS. It's interconnectedness and it's data sharing. Now defining computing. I wanna be able to sort of blur the lines between infrastructure, communications, and then actual computational concerns when we look at what we mean by com computing at that distributed edge. Uh, Operational technology and information technology, that tuple, that combination platter of those two things together provide us a mechanism for repeatable, secure, appropriately sized, measurable, uh, uh, definable uh, hardware, software, transport and communications all packaged together. This is really where from an industry partnership perspective, industry can help the DOD. Uh, aligning and building things where it's, you know, no organization can, can run everything from a single provider. So we have to be able to work collaboratively together as industry to be able to provide the best value based on the operational needs of our DOD customer base. And traditionally, we've done that in sort of isolated silos of somebody generates hardware, and then somebody puts a base OS or load on that hardware, and then somebody adds application workloads to that hardware. By being able to combine that together so you sort of get a out of the factory configuration that can then be customized or configured as needed, that's the combination that, that both OT and IT can provide for our DOD base. Now, decision dominance. This is from, uh, well, he wasn't the former uh, Future Commands Commander when he made this quote. He is the former Future Commands Commander now. He's retired. Uh, General Murray pointed out that it's the ability for a commander, and he takes sort of the OODA loop terms himself, and, and categorizes them as sense, understand, decide, act, and assess. So you've still got decide and act. Sense sort of becomes your observe, and understand and assess become that orient aspect of the OODA loop. Uh, to do those things faster and more effectively than an adversary. And I'm going to, to use an analogy that a colleague of mine, Chris Yates, does with, with the game of chess. So in a perfect world, in a CJADC2 where, again, convergence and overmatch and ABMS are providing ubiquitous comms of everything everywhere, you can always make the best move because you're, you're, you have all of the information. So that's one best case scenario from a, a decision dominance is, is the ability to operate faster and effectively because you have all of the insight, all of the available intelligence. I would, I would suggest that uh, either due to self-inflicted wounds, due to a congested environment, or due to peer adversary inflicted wounds, a contested environment, we need to have prepared cases as well. One of those prepared cases is best decisions based on available information. Uh, I, I term this as relevant data or relevant intelligence. Uh, in the morning session, uh, General Miser termed it as pertinent information or pertinent intelligence, same, same concept. It's when you can only see part of that chessboard, but you still have to make a move, what do you do? Uh, the other prepared case is making faster decisions. Uh, in a traditional game of chess, I make a move, my opponent makes a move. I make a move, my opponent makes a move. If I have an opportunity based on available resources and available intelligence 
to make two moves for every one move that my adversary makes, I got a much better chance of winning that game of chess. And that's, that's again, that's the, the faster uh, aspect for decision dominance. So you may have more effective based on, on intelligence that you have locally uh, that, that is relevant, that is um, readily available, or you can just operate at a speed and a cadence that an adversary cannot. I want to take those terms that we've defined now and I want to look at those conceptually from a, the impact that data locality can make in actually compressing that decision-making timeline uh, and shortening that kill chain. So on the, on the right-hand side, I'm going to, to go out at that, at the, the diagram and sort of break out the individual pieces. I don't know who to attribute the diagram to. I, I, I got it in a LinkedIn distributed comms thing back in 2019. But it is still, I think, incredibly relevant. Uh, I, I want to start on the left-hand side, though. And, and again, my, my high school Latin taught me that data is already plural. It's the plural of datum. I understand that. But for the purpose of this discussion, the plural of data itself is not intelligence. Uh, it, this isn't about getting more, it, it's not coal that you compress it and get a whole bunch of it together and you wait a long enough time and you end up with a diamond. That's not what, what data does for us. Uh, data going from data to actionable intelligence, moving from data to intelligence or information requires compute. That's the, that's the critical aspect. So I'm, I'm not disagreeing with the, the morning session on, on maneuvering data around the Pacific as well, maybe I wouldn't call it the key to decision dominance, it's a key to decision dominance, but wouldn't it be better if we moved actionable intelligence around? Wouldn't it be better if we created that initial connectivity, that initial curation, cleansing, deduping, whatever, to that raw data so that it can be more effectively acted upon? And that takes compute. Intelligence is also different for different decision makers, either because their AOs are different um, or because their scope and their, their temporal constraints are different. So as we, or, or because the tooling that they're using, the technology that they're using and the decisions that they're attempting to make require different levels of intelligence, whether that is relational knowledge or uh, insights for uh, predictive analytic models and training and AI. And, and, and at the end of the day, data locality, so being able to put your compute as close to where the data is itself so that you can turn it into actionable intelligence. It's not about a sufficiently stocked data lake. We do talk a lot at the, the CIO, CDO level about data lakes, about data warehousing, about sort of broad scoped uh, data storage topologies. Uh, I would suggest relevant to distributed uh, edge computing that it's about being able to effectively fish out of your data pond, your data pool, and your data puddle, and not just your data lake. It's being able to address and take what you have available to you and make it useful. Now, on the right-hand side, I'm sort of breaking down this cartoon diagram to say that, that again, data itself is a starting point and not an end point for the decision-making process. So information, that second guy, or what I would call actionable intelligence, is where we decorate that raw data, or we tag it, or we cleanse it, or we curate it, or we dedupe it. We operate on the data so that it can be more effectively acted upon by other operations. As we move to the right, knowledge is relationships between and across the datum and, and the knowledge points. We're, we're ex expanding our understanding of how one data element relates to another. Think spatial temporal correlation. So being able to have same things happening, same space and same time, and being able to, to get a clearer picture of what's going on because of that. Uh, insights add behavioral normalities or anomalies. So you're looking for, let's say from a defensive cyber perspective, uh, you're generating insights on stuff that shouldn't be happening, 
when you're sniffing packets on the network. Or you may have insights for uh, best shooter for particular sensor profiles based on uh, having uh, behavioral normalities identified for um, what has the best effect, what has the best kinetic effect, given the signatures and the data that you have. Wisdom then ultimately becomes forensic insights. Um, uh, so that's, uh, how do I make my models? Uh, one, one of the things that was mentioned by uh, Chief Rivera in the morning session is that anytime you have a program that talks about a cop, whether it's a persistent cop, a crop with a relevant operational picture, it's sort of doomed to failure in his terms. Uh, I, I would suggest the same is sort of true from an understanding and utilization of uh, AIML predictive models on day one. Models suck on day one. They need to be trained and iterated on in order to be able to add value. So that wisdom, that forensic insight becomes critical for being able to improve the timelines. A linear programming will not never get better over a given time slice. Uh, predictive analytic models that are trained will continue to shorten and shorten and shorten the decisions that they, that they create, the outputs that they, that they create. Okay, now I want to sort of switch gears and look at uh, the, the similar aspects for that distributed edge computing. So the data level, the, co the compute workload level, and then specifically AIML uh, painted within that CIA triad. So the CIA confidentiality, integrity, and availability. It's typically positioned as a, an information security model. So from a data perspective, I want to know confidentiality. Um, am I preventing unauthorized disclosure of the data or the intelligence? So is it protected? From an integrity perspective, uh, did I let anybody futz with it? Has it been modded inappropriately? Is it trustworthy data? Is it something I can put into a model? Is it something uh, that I can use for an insight? And then availability. Uh, and, and I like that this is a timely access and it's by authorized users. So is it relevant? Is it meeting a particular temporal threshold? Is it accessible? Can it be consumed by, by others without breaking confidentiality? That's a traditional CIA definition. Now I want to look at it in terms of exploring that through the lens of a distributed application workload. So now from a compute perspective, a confidentiality, I still want to answer the question, is it protected? Am I preventing unauthorized deployments? Am I preventing CM drift? Uh, am I compartmentalizing it? Am I allowing network segmentation, compute segmentation, data or storage segmentation? Or am I putting myself in an environment where every, every service microservice capability knows about every other service microservice capability, even if I'm saying I'm securing the, the intercommunication over uh, mutual TLS? The confidentiality here is being able to know that you can repeat the deployment of the workload similar to you can, you can assure the access to the data or the intelligence from, from the, the data perspective. Integrity is no authorized modifications of the workloads pre or post deployment. This is your SBOM. This is the show me that I have a secure software supply chain. Show me that what I put on the machine is what I meant to put on the machine. And then provide compliance enforcement guardrails so that I can't take it outside of the scope of what it's supposed to do. That's, that's is it trustworthy? Is this workload, can I use this distributed workload for and against the data and intelligence that I'm providing to it? And then availability is, do I have timely access to APIs or to event-based access by authorized users? Is it relevant and accessible? Can we distribute this is the, from the morning session, is it discoverable? Can I figure out a way to be able to share relevant information with others? CIA explored through the lens of execution of AIML models are looking at that same thing, confidentiality. The protected here is, can I prevent unauthorized utilization of the model? Uh, is it open for anybody? Is it, how is it protected? Um, how do I prevent uh, exploitation of the model from an integrity perspective? Is it trustworthy? Garbage in, garbage out. Um, what, what 
are we doing to prevent or, or to counter a model bias? Uh, and availability, is it relevant and accessible? Can I do timely model updates? Uh, can I make uh, iterations? Can I modify uh, and expand the purpose of the model, either by changing the goes intas or by using the goes outas for different reasons? The next aspect I wanted to be able to look at is exploring different operational models. And each of these, uh, this is sort of looking at feasibility in a congested or a contested environment. Each of these sub-bullets could really be their own talk. I'm really positioning them here more to identify anticipated behavior on the distributed battlefield when you are in a congested or a contested environment. The, the first approach I, I label as a trickle approach. So in a disadvantage, in a disconnected, a purely disconnected, you're totally denied, you are a self-licking ice cream cone for a period of time. You have an expiration policy based on, on whatever the ceiling is for your storage and compute capabilities. You try to do the best job that you can. Uh, I look at it from a, an army perspective on a first general order. I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. Well, you're never properly relieved in a disconnected or denied environment, so you're constantly doing that same job, and you can't do it ad infinitum. You can do it for a long time, and you try and put the compute and, and, and storage in place to be able to allow you to prosecute and execute the mission. But the other DDIL aspects, the disconnected, the intermittent, or the low bandwidth, there are different ways to be able to pass and share data around on the, on the battlefield. And one of those approaches is a trickle approach. It's a, I'm going to have QoS constraints that allow me to take certain amounts of information from certain domains. And uh, we were looking at things in the, in the morning session uh, like intelligence, uh, fire and effects, uh, sustainment, or C2. So different sorts of buckets of data have different QoS on, on them as far as how much data, given the restricted bandwidth that you have, you leverage and use. Uh, another alternate approach is that burst approach. So do I save stuff up, save stuff up, save, save stuff up, compress it, and then push it out? That may be a strategy to, to be used for uh, training AI ML models. And you don't have the wherewithal at your level of of um, distributed edge in order to be able to train the model there, but you don't want to be able to throw out the, the data that can be used for training. You don't have uh, the availability to keep it streaming in real time, so it's a batch processing sort of exercise and then a burst approach. Uh, both of those approaches do bring into light a need for uh, moving away from what's been traditionally looked at as a data synchronization issue uh, data synchronization is relevant when it's a, it's a dad-kid relationship. And we dropped comms, dad to kid. We got comms back. The kid dumps whatever he was doing. Dad gives him new guidance. Dad gives him new data. This is more a peer-to-peer -peer relationship when we're talking distributed edge computing. So in that peer-to-peer, -peer, in, in, uh, in that sibling relationship, there's a data reconciliation. Even if one sibling has a hell of a lot more available knowledge. They didn't have what that disadvantaged or disconnected or intermittently latent uh, unit or edge node has. So you want to be able to have a reconciliation that passes the goodness from the edge node to the, the more fuller node and, and reconciles both ways. So it's a bi-directional versus a simply swapping out approach. All of these are, uh, I, I would suggest, are necessary for distributed edge computing because we don't live in the ideal world where comms are always, I mean, it's, it's, it's a great beatific vision, um, but as long as we have a peer or near peer adversary, we, can we should always assume that contested environment and be able to plan accordingly. Going to next switch to categories of technology accelerators to be able to uh, address distributed edge computing. The first one is event-driven microservice architectures. 
And, and this is sort of looking at, at the data or workload level, uh, the value and the variety. So we've got sort of five Vs of data. You've got your volume and velocity, your variety, your, your veracity, and your value. I think the same thing can be said for workloads and models as well. So event-driven architectures allow you to have strongly typed uh, triggers, events, whether those are cloud events, whether that's uh, a, a, a message written to a topic. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a mechanism for being able to compartmentalize the work that gets done at that edge node in a, in a repeatable and a controllable way. Uh, distributed integration is a way to be able to address data variety. That's that curation and cleansing. Uh, that's the operating on the data. That's the turning of data into actionable intelligence. And the distributed integration part is, it's not an event service bus. It's not a client server architecture. It's not a phone home to be able to do a, uh, uh, an ETL or an ELT sort of transformation. Uh, it's, it's taking data and, and operating on it as close to where that data is and to do that at an atomic level. Automation and management, both from an OT perspective and an IT perspective, provide dynamic, consistent, repeatable, scalable, and secure infrastructure. Uh, every session that I've attended today has, has addressed automation at some point. Uh, part of it is to remove human in the loop error. Part of it is to address uh, timelines. And part of it is simply to say, let the gray matter do what only the gray matter can do. But anytime you've got a use case where compute and gray matter could do the same job, let compute do that job. Uh, and then ultimately, edge and open hybrid cloud. So being able to get to that workload volume and that workload velocity uh, requires that we take benefits, I, I, I'm hesitant to call them micro clouds at the edge because the NIST definition, one of the components for the NIST definition of, of cloud is ubiquitous comms. One of the things we base distributed edge computing on is I don't have ubiquitous comms. So I look at edge in an, in an open hybrid environment as the, as the way to be able to address data workloads uh, with varying amounts of volume and velocity across that spectrum. To look at it from, to, to break down those categories into a more textual representation, enterprise automation helps to reduce your attack surface footprints, both physically and digitally. You can get more things onto smaller footprinted pieces. It also prevents ad hoc human in the loop errors. It doesn't prevent all errors. The good news though is when automation is gooned up and you fix the automation, you fixed it for all use cases for that automation. When you have in human in the loop interaction, uh, when you fix it on Tuesday, it's not necessarily fixed on Thursday. Runtime observability and tracing are also essential uh, as accelerators for being able to manage and know what's going on. It becomes even more relevant as, as DOD goes into more autonomous systems. Uh, being able to maintain a trace of, uh, and, and this goes beyond simply logging. Logging is an important characteristic, but again, in order to be able to uh, assess, in order to be able to uh, access and, and visualize what, what's happening uh, with the digital transfer, whether that's transport or whether that is data in use versus data at rest versus uh, data in transit itself. Being able to have observability for that, uh, audited observability al allows other operations, other software defined operations to occur on the data and on the workloads that leverage that data. Uh, that leads to the next piece, software defined policy. So behavioral remediation or policy enforcement. Being able to express rules, express policy as code allows us to do things like the example I put here, sandboxing or quarantining a bad actor on a defensive cyber operation detection threshold. So rather than being able to just say, okay, I'm gonna kill that, and then lose the valuable intelligence of, of the 
the offensive operation that was occurring against you, being able to sandbox or quarantine allows you to have a protected environment to be able to continue to inspect. I mentioned the atomic aspect for distributed integration. Uh, also done in a cloud compatible way, and I mentioned that for EDA, for event-driven architectures as well. Nothing that we're doing at the edge has to be orthogonal to the approach that, that's taken from a JWCC perspective for the broader cloud. It just needs to be able to have resilience for when that ubiquitous communication isn't available. You can't scale ad infinitum, you scale to a ceiling because you have physical constraints. Uh, there's also a need, I think, for intentional isolation and multi-tenancy. Whether that's done at net, you know, so this is the network segmentation versus compute segmentation uh, versus storage segmentation. Uh, being able to isolate prevents self-inflicted wounds. It prevents trampling underfoot. It prevents grouping everything together. So from a, a data governance and a data provenance, uh, again, going back to that CIA uh, triad, understanding your confidentiality and integrity is easier to express, it's easier to evaluate when you have compartmentalized uh, pockets. When you glob everything together, it's a harder story to tell and it's a harder, it's a harder ball of yarn to unwind. EDA and serverless, so event-driven architecture and, and serverless invocations, it's a way to scale to zero. Um, you can maintain traditionally quiescent assets. I'm going to put a bunch of compute in place, I'm gonna be running stuff, and when data comes in, I'm ready for it. Uh, that doesn't scale very well, especially as you add more uh, computational data at the edge. But what does scale is being able to have event-based triggers that will say, when this data comes in, spin this process up. When this data is no longer coming in, kill the process. And, and you don't have quiescent assets. You don't have a larger footprint. Uh, you have the ability to do uh, your Black Friday event, your, your burst capabilities, uh, based on a bunch of data coming in simultaneously, but then you have a steady state approach as well. So what would good look like in something like, like this. Operating securely, at speed, with sufficient accuracy, is really about relevant data or applications on any footprint, anywhere. And consistency, compatibility and standards-based, uh, flexibility in the infrastructure allows for uh, further collaboration and more resilience from a force posture perspective. This is the shameless plug for uh, where we are, booth 118, uh, other, other topic areas that fit within this distributed edge computing is sort of speed and reliability with real-time kernel uh, utilization at the edge, operationalizing AI ML with ML ops, uh, zero touch provisioning for being able to again add that speed to to deployments and and the new releases for Red Hat Device Edge for giving you a, a multiple heterogeneous ways to be able to adapt that um, uh, both the recomposable architecture stage and the disposable architecture stage from that previous edge slide. And with that I open it up for Q&A. I think so. Are the slides posted to the FCSI? Sorry? Slides, did the slides get posted afterwards with the recording? I don't think so. But they are accessible. I think they'll all be uploaded to some website. They're going to be uploaded to some website, and I can also make them available. So. I'll ask. Thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, I, 
I don't think without a change to contemporary tactics, techniques, and procedures, that that's an easy question to answer. I, I still think we train the force to do a more centralized C2 while we ask the force to do a distributed C2. So uh, I, 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 can, I can suggest some uh, milestones or north stars based on sensor availability in a particular AOR, uh, but there's still a there's still a training thing that has to. Th this this is not unilaterally addressed by by having, you know, wicked good tech. It's, it's a technology and a culture. Uh, it's a technology and an implementation and process. I think if you say culture to the military, they're like, what the hell are you talking about? You know. Uh, uh, but if you say implementation challenge, they get that. If you say process challenges, they definitely get that. Um, and I think it is the combo platter of there's some technology acceleration. There's also some technology inhibitors. You, you know, if you have a mandate that comes down and says, thou shalt do AIML, and, and, and you don't do regular data ingest well right now, you can't jump that chasm. Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, at some point, you know, unobtainium is unobtainium, and reality wins. Uh, e even if it upsets people, it still wins because it's reality. I, I, I don't have a better answer. Do you, do you have a point of view or thoughts about uh, the Chinese military and the architecture? It's also Yes. And your models were developed over here by a bunch of big brain guys or girls. Yep. And they were propagated out to the edge. But the if, if you're lucky, they were propagated out to the edge, but okay. So there is a discussion around having the models, I don't want to call it self healing, but self learning, and then being modified on the fly in the battle space without having to go back to Mother Earth. Okay, so the, the, the software architect in me wants to apply a compositional pattern to that problem space. I don't want to say a model itself is self-healing and learning. I want to say you actually have models, plural. And it's the aggregation of those models that allow it to be used for different purposes. So when you specialize or when you have particular constraints new to a particular environment, you may add in a new model, you may change uh, variables on data execution and inputs for existing models, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's a one ring to rule them all kind of approach. I don't think there's one Uber model that you do this with. I think it's broken out into uh, an aggregate of models. That, that would be my architectural approach for addressing that. It is. You mentioned a term you. You assume it's being human. Sure. Yeah. And you can't have enough big brains in the battle space to be able to do those on the fly mods with human. There has to be some right. level of literally machine art, literally, in order to modify the models on the fly to adapt to changes. Or, or you are self limited to the existing constraints on that model and the decision criteria that you... Yes. I, I, I don't disagree. I think that there is room for um, existing technology to come side saddle with emerging technology, predictive analytic models, to be able to uh, address some of the, look at it like a finite constraints resolver. I'm going to have uh, environmental constraints that I know about at T1, and then at TN, I'm going to be surprised. So how do I address that potential surprise at TN? Uh, one way to do that is by being able to 
uh, lean in and, and have a deployment approach. That's that recomposable architecture where you can put more wherewithal behind either the thing that's invoking the model or the aggregation of models in that same environment. Probably a little bit beyond the scope of this conversation. Sure, but still a good, yeah. I won't keep anyone. We're good. Thank you. Enjoyed that. This, uh, what you're talking about is near and dear to me, and uh, I love this kind of